Good morning, Central Baptist Church. Good morning. Just in light of last week, I just want to clarify before we get started that I did go to the bathroom already. And um, everything else, I'm just going to let sleeping dogs lie. So let's go there. Um, hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Wonderful time being with family. Uh, we had a great opportunity to, to go down to Houston where I got to sit on a porch and just kind of relax in the suburbs and, and work on this sermon. And there was so much food. We were expecting more people than what came. So there was a, a, one, of those, you know, one of those great Thanksgiving pictures of a nice long table with turkeys and yams and potatoes and this and that and the other thing. I made something. Kim made something. Robert made something. Um, uh, Yes, we did have macaroni. We did. We did. Um, and I got to say that my, my sister-in-law, Natalie, made the best turkey I have had in my 43 years of existence. I mean, that was unbelievable. She's from the Caribbean, though, so she did a little something extra, put a little jerk or something into it that just... <laughs> Like it was, I'm carving the turkey and I'm like sampling as I go along. So the portion getting onto the plate to go to the table is really small compared to what it should have been. But it was great. You know, you're snacking throughout the morning. It was just, it was a really great time. Some great football to watch. It was a good, good day. And, and Robert and I, the next day on the way to the airport, had great sandwiches to take to the airport. Because those next day turkey sandwiches are something awesome to just enjoy. Um, but I want to I want to take this time. We're going to look today. We have begun our Share Jesus campaign. We are looking over the next year to be really truly focused on what it means to share Christ with the world. And so I want us to think about that because as we're going out, I, I want us to think a little bit about what it is we're inviting people into. When we present the gospel, when we talk to people about who Jesus is, what are we offering them? What are we giving to them? And what does the gospel look like after we talk about the forgiveness of sins? What does it look like after that? Because there's a whole lot of living to be done after you accept Christ. And so what does that mean for us? So turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. If you are using the Pew Bible, it's page 1133, page 1133. And I know in your bulletin that it says uh, verses 5 to 18, I think it is. I'm actually going to be focusing a little bit smaller, even though I'm going to read uh, beginning from Romans 8 verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 17, and it's 17 where we're really going to end up. But I want you to hear what Paul is saying. If we could all please stand for the reading of God's word. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Share with your neighbor. Share with your neighbor. The scriptures read this way, and please listen, because these are the words of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, 
are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I want you to begin listening really closely right here. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, through all of this reading of Scripture, you bring us to a glorious truth. Father, would you help me? Be the one who makes the way. That by the Spirit, the one who indwells us all, who brings to us a spirit of sonship, makes us your children. That we would hear the words that you would have us to hear. And Lord God, that we would celebrate the life that you've given us out of the death that we were in. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to kind of catch us up and go over a couple of things that we talked about here, just to make sure that everybody's clear before we really get to the meat of today's word. Now, Paul says in verse 9 that those who are Christian are not in the realm of the flesh anymore. We read that in verse 9. You are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. That's an interesting phrase, that talking about being in the realm of. And so what we know is that those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now that means that the people who are in the realm of the flesh do not accept Christ as their Savior, as their atoning Savior. They are hostile to God. They are at war with God. Now regardless of what they may say in their minds, they are at war with God. And so to be in the realm of the flesh means to be hostile with God. And we're hostile with God towards God, and that we do not submit to God, this is in verse 7, that's an act of our volition. We, we choose not to do it, but also we cannot submit to God. That's opportunity. We just simply, when we are not in Christ, we can't love God in any way, shape, or form. We don't want to, and we choose not to. Now, he contrasts this with those who are in the realm of the Spirit. If being in the realm of the flesh means that all of the hostile actions that we previously mentioned are there. That being in the realm of the spirit means the exact opposite. It means having a sense of life and peace that comes from the proper fellowship with God that we may have craved before, but we could not have. Now, I don't mean craved, like I said, in the sense that we desire it, because no one desires it. Romans 3 talks about this. No one seeks after God. That's what the scriptures say. But what I'm talking about is that inner sense that's, that's always there. You see, since we were made in the image of God, God made us to have relationship with Him. And when that opportunity for a relationship is removed, that desire is still there. And that desire that seeks after ways to worship and to follow. People do not understand what's, what's happening around them when that real intimacy, that real fellowship with God is taken away. And so what they'll do is they'll put substitutions in there that they think will take the place of God. Alright? And those can be things that are, you know, as obvious as, you know, they become a drug addict or they do some other horrible thing. 
Or it could be something as simple as just thinking that their children or their spouse or some other thing, their job is what's supposed to bring them fulfillment. But that's not the way that God designed us. But that desire is there. Um, Augustine talked about that, that our, we have a, a, a God-shaped void inside of our bodies. And until he fills it, we will seek to fill it in some other way. That God-shaped void that's there. It is an inborn desire that comes from being made in the image of God. We want to see ourselves clearly in this world. But since the true image has been made to look wrong because of sin, we, we think that the proper reflection of our image is found in choices and actions that ultimately are just destructive. And this is what Paul means when he says in verses 5 through 7, that those who live according to, their, to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds on what the Spirit desires. You see that there's, there's only two options. You can't have, well, I'm kind of with the flesh and I'm kind of with God. Your desires, according to the way that, that God has made us, are either for God or they're for the flesh. That's what God is doing inside of us. Once our eyes have been opened to just how blind we were to what is actually good, and that's pretty much what salvation is. It's the opening of our eyes to see something beautiful where we thought before that it was simply ugly and ridiculous. The seeking to be forgiven, that's the impact of the gospel. But the gospel is more than just forgiveness for sins. See, as verse 12 says, we're getting closer to where I want us to kind of park for today. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. See, our obligation is to one thing. It's, it's to be controlled by the Spirit. And therefore, it is not to another thing, which is to be controlled by our flesh. And what Paul is saying here is the move from being someone who is dominated by our sinful desires into being a world where we are dominated by our spirit-led desires puts us in a place of obligation for how we live and what we share. You see, God wants us to share this with other people, to tell other people. And that's part of the obligation that we have. Paul wants us to recognize the, the degree of change that happens so much that, that he changes the way he speaks at this point. Look at how he's talked up until now. He's talked about being in the realm of, being in the realm of, being in this place, in this place. He changes from that kind of location language to relational language. Look at what he says right here. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in verse 12, and in verse 14, he gives it to us. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of of God. He moves to that language which talks about the relationship that we'll have, rather than just kind of the position that we'll stand in. Some of the people that, that you talk to really couldn't care less about their sins being forgiven. They don't understand the idea of sin. They don't believe that they've really done anything wrong. It's not the most readily accessible idea for them to wrap their heads around. But the idea that they can move from the family they are in into a family where they have a free exchange of love, where relationships are good and whole, where there is a seeking and a desire to make people happy, thrilled, enjoying the world that they're in, that is the most amazing idea that can ever cross their path. Look at what Paul says in verse 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Our becoming a follower of Christ does not make us slaves to simply another cruel ruler. That move from being in the flesh to being like in a mean spirit of some sort. But rather, it brings you into a family as a valued member of that family. Instead of being in the flesh, you are now a son or a daughter. The father has a, a responsibility to care for you, and not like a slave that can be sold off or killed or pushed to the side for whatever reason. And the people of Paul's day were used to seeing this. You know, slavery was common in the ancient world. It doesn't have the 
intonations that it has here in the United States. Um, and people in Paul's day would be used to seeing, hey, if you were captured in the war, you went to work in someone's house. And you could kill your slave, you could send your slave to fight for you in the army, you could do whatever you wanted to to your slave. They would be used to the fact that you could be working next door to someone for years, and all of a sudden that person's gone, and the master's just like, oh, I just sent him away. I just got rid of him. God's relationship to you is not making you a slave because he did something good to you. God's relationship to you is making you his child because he did something good to you. You're not a slave, but a child. And Paul sets up a very different dynamic for our lives in Christ, that we are adopted as sons and daughters. Now this is a move that, that blows the mind. You know, I love the great doctrines of the church. I love to teach. You can tell from the way that I preach that I love to teach. It's just, it's what's inside of me. I love to share the truths of the Word of God. If I had my druthers right now, I'd be teaching a class on the early church and systematic theology. It's the kind of class that three people would attend. <laughs> right? Because it's not something, it's just, it's the way that I am. I love those deep truths of our faith. And I think doctrine is really, really important. And as a pastor, one of the things that I'm called to do in the scriptures is to guard the truths of the faith. But part of the narrative that we need to share with people today is the narrative of family. These truths that we can share with them, all oh, your sins will be forgiven, they're not as important today as relationships are. Now that doesn't mean that you take that truth and you put it to the side, but what it does mean is that we need to shift how we're talking about the narrative. Probably some of this is because people can get truth anyway. I can go onto my phone and find a whole lot of truth by going to Google or just following my Facebook feed, right? I can see what a whole bunch of people think is a whole lot of truth about every presidential candidate that's out there, about every little movement that has a hashtag associated with it. I can see a whole lot of truth out there. I can get my information from wherever I want. There's lots of information. There's not a whole lot of relationship though. We talk about having a thousand friends on Facebook. People we haven't seen since high school graduation. And if it weren't for the fact that their birthdays came up on our Facebook feed, we would never think to say happy birthday to them. All right? Relationship, deep relationship, is not something that's a part of our culture. It's not a value of our culture. But true relationship, personal connection that runs deep, it's not going to be betrayed by a foolish drama that we come up with on a day to day. That's great. You know, as a pastor, there are, there are two types of encounters I usually have. One has to do, usually, with, uh, one has to do, sometimes, with ministry work here at the church. Someone has a concern about a church function or a ministry opportunity that could be there. Most of the other encounters are actually personal. The people have a pain in their life or a challenge that they want their pastor to share and say, explain how is God involved in this particular moment in my life? Because I'm not seeing God right now. And that's the type of stuff that, that honestly keeps me up. It's one of the things that over and over again confirms to me how completely inadequate I am for the job of pastor. Because there are weights that are there that all I am is simply the conduit to God and praying that God works through me in that particular moment. Because in myself, I don't have a whole lot to share. But I do know a God who has a lot to share about those things. And so I turn to Him. And when people who come to you at those times, when someone comes to you, there's a burden. And you can tell, sometimes someone doesn't even need to say anything. You can just see it on their face. That there's a weight that is, that is just hanging on them. You know, what, what they're asking at those times is, how does this experience show that I'm connected to God? Why is there so much confusion in my life right now? Does God even care? And Paul's response to that question, does God even care? He shares with us in two ways. One, again, that God makes us his children. And he does that by giving us something. Notice how he talks about it here. That we have received the spirit of sonship. 
This is something that God brings about. We don't contribute anything to this process. God does it all to bring us into his family. Now, this is not a casual relationship. This is not like, you know, you and God be in the elevator and you say hello, and then you remain quiet facing the walls for the entire rest of the way down in the elevator. That's not the kind of relationship that God is seeking to have with you. This is not the tense relationship that, that comes with a, a parent who is overbearing. This is the act of God who brings his presence into the lives of people who were his enemies. He takes those who were his enemies, he jumps them over the rank of slave and makes them their, his children. You see, this is what God does to us and God does for us so that we can have this next realization which is really huge. And this is verse 17. We're not God's slaves, we are his children, and so therefore we cry, Abba, Father. Now, this is an amazing statement. As some know, others may not. Abba is, it's a Hebrew, it's an Aramaic word, but it's a derivation of Hebrew. It's a word that means father. It can also mean dad. Right? So when Jesus is in the Gospels and he talks about Abba, Father, the Jews didn't even say God's name. They wouldn't even say Yahweh, except for maybe one or two days out of the entire year. They wouldn't even say his name. And here's Jesus, not just calling God by name, but calling him Daddy. Now, you got to get into your minds what kind of relationship that means that you have to God. It was a number of years ago. I went into Fairway. It was around this time of year. I think I was doing New Year's Eve shopping there. Christmas shopping for some food. And you know when you go into the fairway up on 125th Street, there's the big walk-in refrigerator area, right? And it's so cold in there that they provide you with jackets before you walk in that door. Because even on a summer day, you're going to need something to go in there. And I remember going in there, and as I was tooling around my shopping cart, there was a, an Orthodox Jewish man with his son. And his son was, you know, in the, where the child sits in the cart, right? And the dad kept taking the hood of his fur-lined jacket that they give you to walk into the fairway refrigerator section. And he would go up to his son, he would like flip the hood over and then flip it back, right? Flip the hood over and he was playing with his kid. And his son kept going, Abba, Abba, Abba! Do you see what relationship God has set up with you? Do you see what kind of relationship he's calling you into? Not God far away, but Abba, cut it out. Abba, you're intimate with me. Abba, you care with me. Abba, you are here with me. Abba, Father. Paul is using this in the city of Rome. Now, the city of Rome is a Greek and Latin-speaking town where he's using an Aramaic word, right? This is like me going up to Washington Heights and speaking German, all right? It would, who up there is going to understand German or Russian up in Washington Heights? Very few. But this idea of the intimacy, of the relationship between people who were slaves to sin and people who now can call God Father, Abba has so taken over the gospel message of the church that even in Rome, that's the best way that Paul can explain it. Paul uses this to highlight the truth that the Spirit's work should not be overshadowed by the truths of the faith to the exclusion of the emotional impact of the Spirit's work. Because how does he phrase it? Look at the end of verse 15. And by him we cry. Cry. That's a word of passion right there. Not in by him we say. Not in by him we remark. Not in by him we tell. But by him we cry. Abba, Father. You don't get how important that is. When we were in Denver, um, Robert learned how to ride his bike when he was in Denver. 
but actually he, he picked it up really quickly. He'd had training wheels on his bike as he was riding around the seminary campus. And, and it came to be springtime, and Kim and I said, all right, well, you know, he was complaining, I want the training wheels off my bike. He's, he's like five, or no, he was like four. And he was hanging out with seven and eight year olds. He thought he wanted to be a big man on campus, and they don't have training wheels on their bike, so I'm not gonna have training wheels on my bike. So we took off the training wheels on his bike, and we had scheduled out like a half hour or 45 minutes to teach him how to ride his bike. We were there, and the first, I kid you not, the first push we gave him, he rolled away. And Kim and I kind of looked at each other, I guess we go inside and have breakfast now, because we done taught the kid how to ride his bike, so our work here is done, right? So we go inside, this is a couple weeks later, Robert would get up early in the morning, it was a great campus to be on because the kids could just go outside and play. They, we didn't have to watch them at all. They could just run outside and play. And it was like when I was working. We send them out at like nine o'clock in the morning, come back for lunch, come back for dinner, and whatever you do in between, just don't get me in trouble for what you do, all right? So it was early, it was a Saturday morning, I was up because I think I had a paper to write, and Robert had already gone out the door bike riding with his friends, riding around the campus. And then one of the kids comes knocking on our door really hard. And I open up the door, and TC is there, and he lived across the, the hallway from us, and he's like, Robert fell down. He, he, he wants to see you. He wants you. He wants you right now. And so I was like, okay, okay. So we got up, and we kind of took a while to go over to, to where he was. And when we got over there, one of the other parents who was just in the area had already come over to where Robert was. Now, Andrew and his wife had like six kids. They had, it was, it was more than a quiver full. It was, I don't know what you would describe it as. It was just a lot of kids, right? So he is, and Andrew was a big guy. Andrew stood probably about 6'3". He's weighing in at 250, 260. He's a big, and he's kind of like that. He's got that kind of teddy bear kind of face, right? He's a really nice guy, and everybody knew everybody knew everybody on campus. And Andrew was standing over Robert, and Robert's got, you know, Robert's still on the ground. The bike is laying on his leg, and he's crying, and he's crying. And then that moment comes where he's, Andrew's trying to console him. Andrew's trying to say, hey, can I? And he's just crying and crying. And then Robert sees me. And then Robert goes, Daddy! Daddy! And there's that moment where I'm there, and I'm the only one who's bringing him any peace in that moment. Come here, Central. There is a relationship that God has with you that you can only find comfort when you're crying out to the one Father that's looking to relate to you in a whole and complete way. There's going to be a lot of other folks who are around in that time. There's going to be a lot of other relationships which will try to substitute for that relationship of Father. But there's only one Father that you can cry out to who's adopted you as their child and will keep you close and safe forever. There's only one. You know how great that truth is? It is an awesome truth. But there's more than that. Look at verse 16. This is a truth that God makes so real in our lives that the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit. You see, now, in the ancient world, you needed two or three witnesses to establish a truth. So here you are. You've been saved by the indwelling work of the Spirit. God has taken you from a heart of stone and He's given you a heart of flesh so that you can even know what life is right now. And while you are there in that moment saying, Abba, Father, the Spirit is right there with you testifying. He's your child. This is your child right here. This is your son. This is your daughter. Get to know your God. Because that's what He's calling us to. That's truth God testifies to and we can testify to. And that should affect us. That truth should affect us. Not just in what we know, but in how we respond. 
And then God finally gets to the point where he builds on this. Look at verse 17. Now, if we are children, then what? We're heirs. You know, Paul goes so far here as to call us heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now, I want you to think about how many Christians have come before you. How many Christians? So when you are adopted into this house, remember how the ancient world worked, right? The first child pretty much gets it all. Everybody else after that gets diddly over squat. They get nothing. You better go out and be able to earn your way. Jackie Chan is noted for having said that he is leaving nothing to his son of his inheritance. Why? Because if he can make it, he doesn't need my money. And if he's not capable, he's going to waste my money. What does God do? God calls you in, and you're not the twelfth adopted child. You're not the thousandth. You're not the millionth. You're not the one billionth adopted child. You are a co-heir with the very son who got up from the grave who has to save your soul. What does the son receive? According to the scriptures, he receives everything. Guess what you get? You get everything too. You get everything that is out there. The spirit-filled life is what Jesus experienced. Guess what? That's for you. Jesus was raised from the dead. Guess what? Raising from the dead is for you too. Jesus called God his father. He called him daddy. Guess what you can do? That's for you too. You get to experience that. A life free from the soul-crushing pain of sin. Guess what? That's your inheritance too. That's what you get. The whole world, God is sovereign over all creation. And so that's what's for you. The very presence of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with you forever and ever in this life and the life to come. That is for you. What's the goal of all this? What's the goal? Because why does he bring us into his family? What are we inheriting? He says right here. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that, for the purpose of, so that, we may also share in his glory. Have you ever thought of that? That you're not just going to see the glory of God. That you, in fact, yourself will be glorified. Now, not the same glory that God has, but something that is so close to that, that the only way that Paul can describe it is glory that you may share in that glory. That's for you too. Glorification. That is your inheritance. Now we don't have it yet, but we will. We will have that. You know, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. God gives us a little taste right now. But there's a fuller dinner, a banquet, which is coming later on. And it's for everyone who hears the gospel message. And the wording here is really odd because it's weird to talk about us being co-heirs and heirs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's odd because what is it that we're supposed to do? This whole campaign, this whole life. We're supposed to go out there and share Jesus with people. Isn't that weird? We're going to go out and get more heirs to get a part of this inheritance. Normally what you want to do is you want to get rid of heirs so that you have a get greater inheritance, right? This is fairly popular in the movies, right? So what you do, and there's an actual name for this, it's called a tontine, right? A tontine, this is a particular, what they call a trope, a style that they use in movies. And so what happens is there's a whole lot of money, and everyone has kind of a, a buy into this, and they get a dividend or something out of it. But as other people die, someone gets the remaining people get those remaining shares, right? So coincidentally, people who were involved in this taunting, this sharing of the money, tend to have very short lifespans, right? Because they start getting killed off. These were actually legal here in the United States for a while. 
Right? They were usually administered by banks who would pay out the dividends, but now for the most part, tontines are illegal because of the increase in the murder rate that happened when tontines were legal. Right? This makes sense. Now, this was probably most famously illustrated in a very special episode of Scooby-Doo. Now, I don't know if you remember this particular episode, but a colonel had given to Scooby an inheritance, but he, with five other people, had to spend the night in a haunted house. You can see where this is going. The executors of this dressed up as ghosts and started chasing everybody out until, if it hadn't been for these kids and their dog, Scooby finds them out. And at the end of the whole thing, since nobody could spend a night in the haunted house for one night, Scooby gets all the money. Now the irony of this particular episode was that it was Confederate money, so it was worth absolutely nothing. <laughs> An interesting social statement by the writers of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> But you see, that's not us. That's not us. Our lives are more like Brewster's Millions. Now, I don't remember if, I don't know if you remember this classic from the 80s. Richard Pryor and John Candy had their funnies, or close to funnies. Montgomery Brewster, played by Richard Pryor, is a minor league ball player who somehow is related to this very old white guy. A couple of people removed, obviously. This old white guy leaves to Brewster $30 million with the following caveat. You must spend all $30 million in 30 days. If you do that, you will inherit $300 million. And so as Brewster is going out trying to, he's buying stuff, like he goes to a stamp auction and buys a stamp that's worth like $3 million and the guys who are watching over the money who are like, because if he doesn't spend the money, these executors, they get the money. They're like, well, what's he going to do with a stamp? Because the thing had cabinets. You can't burn anything. You can't just like, you know, buy a house and blow it up or anything like that. You have to actually use the things, whatever it is that you buy. And so they say, well, he's never going to be able to get it. And then they receive a letter from the post office with that $3 million stamp <laughs> having been used. And they're like, oh, wow, okay. He's, he buys it. Um, this was back when uh, Tavern on the Green was still open. He buys lunch for like all of the homeless people of New York City at Tavern on the Green or who were in this area. So he's working to get rid of this money. If successful, he's going to win that $300 million. But the more he gives away, this is what nobody understands, the more that he gives away, the closer he is to getting a greater inheritance. The more that you give away, the closer you are to getting a greater inheritance than what you had to begin with. Guess what? Your inheritance is big enough to share. Your inheritance is big enough to share with a million, with a billion, with a trillion people, with every single person who is on the earth, who has been on the earth, who will be on the earth, Every single one of them can have equal portion in this inheritance to become co-heirs with God. That's the promise of God. So Central, these are your marching orders. You have an inheritance to share. So why aren't you sharing it? Let's pray. Lord, we are here Father, I pray that you would move in us to share the great glory of an inheritance that we have in you with those who are dead and dying. Lord God, would you give us a burden on our hearts to overcome all of the minor sufferings that we may see on this side of glory, that we may come into the glory that you have promised us that we may share in yours, Lord God. Father, we ask for your grace to be upon us and Lord, your power to be in us and your conviction to be on our tongues that there is enough room to fill this church a thousand times over. Lord God, would you bring the Upper West Side of Manhattan into our building 
And Lord God, have our truth and your truth of the greatness of God get out into this world. Lord, may we outgrow the walls of this church. Then, Lord God, we need to be in people's homes. Lord God, would you give us a, a grace of fellowship, a sense of community, Lord God, that brings us with joy into your presence, knowing the work and the worth that we have because of what you have done to us and for us. Let us share it, Lord. Let us share it with joy. Thank you. Amen.